Uh, my name is Armando Say. I'm a co-founder and member of the board of directors of a lot of different things, but my primary uh, venture right now is an organization called Dreamport. We run multiple programs for U.S. Cyber Command, the National Security Agency, uh, three-letter and four-letter, and sometimes, you know, sometimes they're symbols. But, you know, and we do a lot of cyber innovation and research, policy, uh, test, you know, evaluation, capability characterization. So that's who I am. We're headquartered in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, with multiple offices there, and we're opening up a new facility um, in uh, Miami real soon and in a couple other places. So that's who we are. I've uh, been around for about four years. We're not for profit. We are 501c4 uh, in our, um, in, in our in, you know, in what we do primarily as a, as, a, as a 501c4. So the topic today is that we were talking about critical infrastructure, right? And uh, technologies, you know, medical cyber, power grid, manufacturing. How do you space? Um, which is not classified currently as critical infrastructure, and we're going to talk about that. <laughs> but uh, what are we doing about the workforce? So I'm getting a lot of demand signal from my DOD partners that are saying uh, recruit, uh, train, and retain, and what do we do to be prepared for what's coming around the corner? Uh, as uh, someone that I support, I won't call them out in the public here, we're on the record, uh, likes to say uh, the government and you know, organizations that we rely on for, for cyber, and critical, infra cyber, critical infrastructure cyber, have to not have the failure of imagination, right? Who would have thought planes would have hit a building, right? We, there were some concepts, the Japanese had done it before, right? They were hitting ships, but who would have thought, you know, entire humans would be used as weapons in a, in a, you know, uh, um, from an aviation perspective, aviation cyber, one of the other things that's also trending pretty hot out there, okay? So, but how do we prepare that workforce that uh, has that ability to imagine across the Department of Defense, across the various government agencies? We can create as many policies as we want, we can tell everyone about the threats, but where's the workforce that's going to build a more secure satellite, uh, the next encryption, uh, the next blockchain or whatever, uh, what, what comes next? So what we have here is a panel representing a cross-section of industry. I'm, um, so we have academia here with Imana, and I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Go ahead. Okay, great to be here. Uh, thanks uh, for having us. So I'm Imana Sheikh. I'm uh, at the University of West Florida Center for Cybersecurity, Associate Vice President. Um, we lead the National Cybersecurity Workforce Development Program, so um, we'll be looking forward to speaking to you all about that in terms of how it addresses this workforce crisis. Um, I also teach uh, AI, cyber, and machine learning, and we are looking at how we can bring together colleges and universities across the country to really address the skills gap and get them into critical infrastructure roles. Um, with the skills from day one. Great to be so that's academia, right? They're prepping the, the future, right? And how are they prepping the future and how will they prep the future and what do they need to do next? Then we have Mr. John Weiler here with the IT. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, IT Acquisition Advisory Council or otherwise known as ITAC, uh, a public-private partnership chartered in 2007 out of the House Oversight Committee. Uh, our, our goal, our mission, our focus is to aggregate commercial knowledge, commercial standards, commercial best practices, and become a conduit into the public sector and the public sector contractors so that we have knowledge of what right looks like and that we don't inadvertently reinvent a wheel that Fortune 500 has already invented. So a lot of our work is mentoring and knowledge transfer, design patterns, and helping folks make better decisions. And the decisions mostly around IT modernizations, IT security, you know, what do I buy? What is its uh, goodness? What is its resilience? Does it fit? And, and those illities around technology is not only a discipline, like in systems engineering and house building, but is also uh, requires an understanding of what the market has already done. If you don't know what right looks like, how do you buy it? Perfect. And I'm a big fan of when we're talking about building the future workforce, when we're talking about filling the gap in the, uh, the government and in societies, right? The large gap in, in, in cybersecurity. And I always say cyber is like saying ocean or sky, right? There's a lot of disciplines and we, can, we have to really think about it in its multidisciplinary uh, categories, not just say the word cyber, uh, because you know, one, my, one person's cyber is not the other, right? And, and so, uh, but I'm a big fan of, those of us who've lived to comb a little bit of gray hair, right? We always talk to each other. We get in, together in rooms. But if we're talking about the future, we should also be talking about the future. So whenever I put events together, I mix what I call the present with the future. And Caitlin Fought, who just finished our internship program that we, ran, we run for the National Security Agency, uh, the eight-week program, it's all virtual, an award-winning program. She's the future. 
So she can tell all of our gray heads here and old heads, like what, you know, what, what is her experience where she's been? Caitlin, t tell us about yourself. Right. Um, my name is Caitlin Fault. I'm a senior at Old Dominion University. I'm also enrolled in my master's in cybersecurity as well at Old Dominion. Um, like Armando said, I just finished up my internship with Missy. I'm really excited to be here. All right. And then also talking about the future, we have Mr. Derek Eichen here from the Pentagon. I'll let him introduce himself and talk about who he represents. So good, good morning, all. This is Derek Eichen. I'm supporting the Department of the Air Force Chief Data and AI Office. Our job in life is to democratize data, which obviously resides in our enclaves, cloud platforms that have entrenched cybersecurity professionals that can tend to block that. So that's what I'm here to talk about today and how we motivate and mentor our, our Caitlin's and, and, and honestly our common info interns to grow them into the next leaders of the Department of the Air Force. Right, so we're gonna kick it off and I'm gonna ask each person a question, but one of the demand signals that I know our organization um, has right now, and I think it's across DOD, is that whole recruit, train, retain mission. And the reason I know it's intense, because I'm seeing social media uh, from uh, posts from organizations that are normally three letter agencies that don't normally post a lot, but in some of the areas that they are posting, just really within the last three weeks, when I became aware of what the intensity is uh, of, of them to do that. They're actually requiring, I know they require my organization uh, when we're working with them to make sure that we have some sort of academic engagement, sort of workforce engagement in whatever they do. And you'll see that, you'll start seeing a lot of social media from the mili our military as they get out there to try to fix this workforce problem by getting out into the public and saying, this is who we are, trying to inspire the mission. So that's one of the demand signals and that's one of the reasons uh, the topic of this panel, uh, so there's a lot of people here who can talk about all the critical infrastructures, right? But without people to protect, defend, detect, you know, you don't really have much, right? Other than a bunch of blinking lights that are uh, self-serving. So, like I said, academia, uh, tell me a little bit about what your organization is doing. I know we work together with the CAE community, Centers of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity. Tell me, what, what are your challenges and where do you think you're going from uh, uh, to, to fix this problem of a workforce, as I hear, that's mostly graduating with a concentration in IT, but not OT or IOT or space or firmware, uh, maybe smidgens of it, but not enough. And so how do we fix that in academia and what, what do you think is happening there? Well, we're trying to address it through multiple approaches. Um, first is the as Armando mentioned, the National Centers of Academic Excellence community that is designated by the NSA and the federal partners, that has grown from 20 institutions nationwide to over 370 institutions in a very short span. And that's really kind of the way of keeping up with the rigor and quality for the evolving cyber threat landscape. But what we realized quickly on is that that's really not enough. No matter how many students we get into IT and cyber degrees across the country, it's not going to be enough. We have new threat landscape uh, uh, scenarios that we're learning from every day. And we need more agile, flexible ways to get um, everybody ready, get them the skills, and get them connected. Uh, and so one of the things that we've done at the University of West Florida in partnership with the National Security Agency is launch the National Cybersecurity Workforce Program, which is a coalition of colleges and universities across the country, where what we're doing is leveraging our academic programs and our training and our faculty expertise to do up rapid, agile, flexible upskilling and reskilling training for individuals who are perhaps transitioning from military or intelligence uh, fields or who are upskilling or who are want to um, get a, a more in depth into an IT or cyber role. And so that program is currently in two years training over 1,700 transitioning military and first responders to specifically go into critical infrastructure roles with an emphasis on defense industrial base, energy and financial services. And the way we're doing that is by looking at what are the emerging employment needs, not just now, but in the future? What are the types of skills and competencies that are gonna be needed for work roles that haven't yet been defined, for example, in OT security? And connecting them with employers and connecting them with hands-on skills and competencies so that we can not only kind of give them those skills and competencies and in industry certs, but we can kind of define the way forward and do it in a much more flexible, agile way to get a lot more pipelines or pathways for people into jobs with the skills needed from day one. One of the things I like that you said, and we'll come back to it, is that contemporary, you didn't use the word contemporary, but that I call it rip from the headlines training. So when, when I get a request from a warfighter, whether it's one of the units of cyber command or other entities of the government, 
uh, the, who spends hundreds of millions of dollars on training programs, what I get is the stuff that they're not getting in those six months or one year, multi hundred thousand dollar courses that they take. So whether it's ransomware or how to deal with ransomware on a foreign uh, PLC, where the language is right to left, not left to right and up, it's up and down. Okay, so I, I know the cybers, you know, I mean, you know, you've taught me about OT, but like, hey, w how do I deal with this device that connects to something more obscure that we don't see in everyday life? So th that's really important with the workforce. And, and I know a lot of the colleges tell me about accreditation cycles, and they, they kind of stick to those programs. But in between those accreditation cycles, there's a whole new world opening up. So that was a great point to make. So, John, for a question for you. When I uh, recently I got asked to write an incident response plan for an entire industry uh, as part of a Department of Defense request, just to, to prototype uh, how would a certain sector, manufacturing sector, I'll say, uh, uh, develops a repeatable playbook for incident response. I, I thought it was an odd request because it's unique to every industry, every business runs, you know, it's a private industry, right? But one of the things I noted was that when when I was seeing the outline for this request is they didn't deal with the supply chain. You're a supply chain expert. So what I told uh, the folks that were bringing this to our attention was, you can do all the cybers, you can do all the blinking lights, but if I take out your supply chain, aren't you still no good to me, right? If you look at what's going on in Ukraine, what are the Russians and the Ukrainians hitting, right? They're hitting the supply chain that you heard about long supply ch chain tail lines. So that tank doesn't work without replacement parts, without changing tires. What do we need to do, and I know you're an expert at this, about handling the supply chain side of, of risk in cyber for critical infrastructure. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, a, a bunch. Um, there has been some great work done in understanding aspects, the most critical aspects of the supply chain that we're talking about here today is in the ITOT domain. So we have to say, okay, there is specific disciplines and understandings and even basic engineering principles that sometimes are not adhered to. So in the OT world, you know, you have a, a system that was developed in 1984, hasn't been updated. How do I look at that system and go, oh my God, I have to modernize that. It's connected to the internet now because of COVID. H how do I understand what the inherent problems are in that architecture and find the best way to actually modernize and get that up to speed? Same thing in government. We have the same practice problem is how do I look at my compute, my portfolio and say, where are the fundamental weaknesses in the electronic supply chain? I have a question for you. Yeah. Is the acquisition workforce ready to tackle that problem? So how do you solve a problem that goes through a government bureaucratic system oh for God. critical infrastructure if the acquisition workforce doesn't know how to write the statement of work, how to do the acquisition, this, this how to validate that? This is a great question, and it's been a problem for 20 years. Uh, we signed an MOU with both National Defense uh, University and DAU to teach a new practice. So first of all, we have to fix the practice. DOD is still using industrial age 1960s engineering practices because they were designed for weapon systems. IT, the digital world, requires a different set of practices, but also a different knowledge base. So we have to usher in the great work coming out of Silicon Valley and Fortune 500 in ways that it's digestible. So knowledge management is back. We need it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take um, a government bureaucrat and show them that this path is actually better, it's very Machiavellian. Mm -hmm. If you don't walk with them and go through that practice several times to a real world scenario, it's not gonna stay retained. We, we set up the Air Force to embrace this new agile world where you're understanding how to measure risk, value, and cost of the technology that you're buying. And if you don't understand the practice and don't have the data to inform that decision-making process, you will fail. I'm wondering if the government needs subject matter experts, maybe they already do it in the acquisition shops. They absolutely shops, do. So that the, they can support the acquisition. Uh, and also, when you, one of the things that I got into, I don't know if Lucian's here in the room, Lucian, when he was at the White House and uh, the prior administration, one of the things he and I worked on together was something called Hack the Building, right? The idea was weapon systems, weapon systems, weapon systems. <laughs> Where are weapon systems manufactured? Inside of a facility. Uh, you have to have certain temperature controls, certain humidity controls. So what happens if I take out the building? <laughs> you know, I take or uh, right. I, I mess with all the IoT sensors that you know that measure humidity, that measure temp. You know, all the things that you need to make sure something doesn't kinetically blow up, right? Also, uh, what happens if I turn on the fire safety systems right in that multi-billion-dollar room, clean room that's manufacturing a weapon system? Everything gets wet, starts to fry. All your blinky light, all your cybers go down, right? Everybody's running out. My hair, my clothes, you know, what you know, whatever. So, uh, cyber is holistic, and I think, like I said, we have to 
deal with it in all its categories. And I think a lot of what we do, and I think John would, would second that, is we look at it in a, in a single container. I'm going to build a weapon system, so I focus on the mil spec or whatever for the weapon system, but I forget that the weapon system is built in a facility that has redundant power, power generators, battery backups, elevators, fire suppression systems, and all that can make, and, you know, and of course environmental systems, that all that can make my production or, or the accuracy of the weapon systems, or if it's biomedical, uh, pharmaceutical, like co the super COVID vaccine, I can dilute all of those things by messing with things that maybe you're not looking at. So we talked about the future, and the future is right there. Uh, Caitlin Fought, who just finished an eight-week right, program, uh, virtual award-winning program. Like I said, I have to say award-winning. You know, it's like when people, someone gets an Academy Award. It's, you know, it's an Academy Award-winning artist. But anyway, Caitlin, um, you're well-educated. Uh, you have a lot of options in your life. You're super smart. You're working on your fifth degree or whatever that is. Tell me about your experiences uh, and tell this audience and the people who are listening virtually. It's like, what the heck do we need to do to get you to come work at Cyber Command or NSA or the Pentagon and not go to AWS? Sorry, AWS. I know someone sponsored here or Google or, or, or whatever. Or even after two years leaving after yeah, they're perfect. Exactly. And, and then go on. So tell me about your experiences. Tell me about you know what motivates you or what you think we need to do. And you just came to the program. Criticize us if you want. You know? <laughs> Honestly, I really don't have a lot of criticism for the program that Missy put on for us. I feel like... They had a lot of mentorship opportunities, and I feel like that's really important. Um, I worked. Your mic on, by the way. Went to, I'm not make sure. Can you guys hear me? Uh, not quite. Hold it closer. Hold it. Oh, there you go. Okay. Now, can we hear me? Okay. Kind of. Good. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, anyways, like I said, I don't really have a lot of criticisms for the program that Missy put on for us, um, other than I wish it was longer. Um, I wish that there was more time because I personally worked with. Um, someone who guided us through something that I didn't have any hands-on experience with in my college curriculum. Um, as someone who's going into a master's degree, I thought that when I finished my bachelor's, I would kind of have an idea of what was going on. And I didn't. I got into the internship and every day I was like, I have no idea what we're talking about right now. So I feel like as far as like recruitment goes and retention, we need more mentorship and people that are willing to teach and help people like me who I understand what you're talking about, but I have no idea how to apply what I've learned in the college curriculum and um, just a constantly changing college curriculum that could help us be more ready for the workforce, I think would be really helpful. Have you done any prior internships inside the government? Because I know some of your co cohort members had, and they talked about being the paper shredder or the button hitter, you know, like 12 o'clock, you hit this button, and then you can go to lunch, and then you come back, and you hit it again. Um, and I'm not saying that's everyone's internship experience, but I know that some of your cohorts, how about yours, in, um, in prior experience? I haven't done good or an bad. internship that was um, anything in the government. The only other internship I've done has been um, a teaching experience where I was working with JROTC students. And I will say that um, the teaching that I did with these students did give them a lot of hands-on. We created labs and they got to set up firewalls, really basic things, because they're in high school. But um, I feel like even programs like that, like utilizing college students to reach these high school students and instill in them the want to learn more and to grow and show them like you can do this one day and you can pass it on to the next generation in order so that way we can all keep growing. So you represent two things. You represent the future. You're also a woman who's underrepresented in cyber and in critical infrastructure tremendously, right? And then we also, so we need young people like you to go to Cyber Command, to go to INL, to, you know, to go to the White House, to work at the Pentagon. But you're gonna get incredible offers. You already have, I know you already, you have offers already. Um, did what, if anything, would have, uh, you know, connected the wires on you of doing service to the nation before going out and making a billion bucks and, you know, in Google world or something, right? Like what, what would motivate you? Even if it was two years or three years, I mean, was it anything? I mean, was, you got to meet General Nakasone, you got to meet, you know, Mr. Inglis, you got to meet all these people in our program, right? Who are all, you know, that could go do and make millions of bucks in other places, right? Uh, but they're, they, they're committed to continuously coming back to the government or being in the government. That's a long career, as General Nakasone told you during his session. W what would inspire people like you to help fill that void? I mean, we need the, vo you know, the void needs to be filled, you know, whether it's this law firm in terms of cyber policy and law, but, but government in particular who has this big demand signal. Like, what's wrong with you guys? We, we have the cooties? We have, you know, the COVID. I thought we got rid of it. Um, well, I do feel like meeting like General Nakasone and Chris Inglis was definitely inspiring. 
And I would consider a field in, I mean, a career in the DOD after having that experience. Um, so perhaps getting out into the community more as the DOD, I know that uh, it was mentioned that they are trying to get out there and do better outreach, but I feel like that's very important as far as recruiting. Um, and again, just making it feel like I'm making a difference and mm -hmm. that's kind of hard to do, especially as an entry level. I know a few people that are entry level in DOD positions and they don't feel valued. And so I feel like giving them a, a platform and making them understand like what you're doing does matter, giving them learning opportunities, um, again, mentorship, all that would make a difference. Yeah, the mentorship word, I know that's big. You know, Cyber Command just posted something on workforce and it led in the social media tag, it was mentorship. I wanna give Derek a chance, our friend there from the DOD, speaking of the DOD, Derek, introduce yourself. Yeah, so Derek, I can hear. Um, so I've been in industry, I've been in government, and I've been in the acquisition community. So Sorry to hear all about of this that. hits me <laughs> here to home. But I will say I'm an innovator. I, I am exercising effective processes to deliver to the warfighter. And, and I have a bed of interns, five of them that I'm mentoring right now, where I literally carve out time to mentor them and give them tasks that I would expect them to complete in a timely manner so that they're delivering to valuable delivering value to the department of the air force so my prime example in my in my quiver is is a is a common info intern i'm not going to name him here because i know we're on the record and i want to get him onto the news but um I, I put a lot of time into giving him water watering the plant making him know you, what you're doing matters to the warfighter and and what I want to enable further for, for incoming civilians or incoming junior officers or even incoming senior officers is that time inside of the operational cell and getting down into a data center or getting into an ops floor, getting into a deployment where they're actually defending a critical asset downrange or getting them out to a major command to hear about the issues that those senior leaders are facing on data or, or cyber challenges or cyber threats, honestly. We're getting a lot of praise and, and sunlight from the, the Deputy Secretary of Defense on how we uh, operationalize our data. And, and that comes really in the form of how do we uh, create the attributes and controls around who can see what data and who can defend what cyber assets and critical infrastructure so that we're putting those people into the de defensive seats where they can go and, and do that. And then also also fill those cyber attack roles that that are predominantly done by the military, but everything leading up to that is is generally done by a by a cyber analyst or a cyber threat assessor, and then and then it's done on various different network levels, which we need to get to as a department to actually fight the war. The right. The Does right everyone need a PhD? Because you're technically Doctor Derek. No, I sir, not Doctor. Yes, Masters. Masters. Okay, yeah. you're the master. Yeah. Uh, and is. You know, uh, a lot of talk with, you know, Space Command, Space Force in the last couple of months for me, as well as, uh, you know, AWS and their satellite technologies, you know, uh, you know, uh, eight, um, uh, Tesla and their Starlink mm -hmm. uh, and SpaceX. And one of the things I'm hearing is upstream workforce, downstream workforce. So people with advanced degrees are considered the, I guess, the upstream workforce. They design, they, they do the algorithms, uh, they do the data science, whatever. But then there's this downstream void I hear of, the, hey, you don't need... A PhD or a master's degree to do the cybers to put in the cyber controls at the where the satellites being built or where the rockets being built or where the missile. What do you think about that? Don't want to put you on the spot. I know. No, be careful. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. it, it takes aggressively six years to grow a PhD. Like that's aggressively in the cyber field. Wow. We don't have enough time in the Air Force or the Department of Defense or even the government writ large to wait six years for that special unicorn to come out of academia. We have to get them from their bachelor's degrees, get them into where they can affect change in the technology that is current today so that they can go back and learn a master's degree, come back to new technology. The Moore's Law is, Moore's Law is broken. Yeah. I mean, we're accelerating technology faster than the pace of <laughs> academia and the pace of, of developing curriculum that, that effectively arm someone coming in to do cyber defense or cyber attack. And and that's why we can't wait for PhDs. So, and I don't know, John, you have a question, but one more question for you. Yeah. So to the Department of Defense take a, take a page out of the book of Tesla and Google where they're saying, look, we have this huge workforce deficit uh, and we focus on these, you know, triple layer interviews and sometimes four and five rounds, right, to get to that one person or two or three people that we want to hire. And they all come from these schools and old schools. But 
um, we did an event called Hack the Port a couple months ago or a month ago, time flies, but, and we had a hacker, uh, never graduated from anybody's college. His name is Sabu, famous, you know, was facing 124 years in prison, uh, got his GED, okay? He started hacking at age 12, okay? Uh, hacked into CIA, most of the major banks, uh, on and on and on, which is when he, when he got caught while he was facing, you know, a, a perpetual lifetime worth of prison. Um, he was born this way, right? He got up, he had the passion, he had the curiosity, he had the interest, and he organically developed, and then he went into groups with uh, like-minded folks with the same skills. Does the Department of Defense, are they looking for that? I know you don't speak for, for them. Is that a, a formula that we need to complement the Caitlin who's getting her master's and you who have a master's and Dr. Elman here who has you know, your PhD and so on and so forth? Do we need that in betwixt combination there? And is there a program for that? Because isn't that how we kind of fix part of the deficit that we have? So part of, part of what is difficult about getting into the government <laughs> is the hiring process. Um, once you're interviewed, it could be three months before you even get a, hey, here's your offer. By that time, kids are looking for a new apartment or a, or a new place <laughs> to stay, and, and their, their facts of lives are changing at, at, at a faster rate than the machine is getting the hiring process. process. is terrible. Um, so to, to me, that's, that's the biggest area where we could improve the onboarding of civilians, um, whether they be ops researchers, data scientists, cybersecurity professionals, that, that, that challenge is, is rife. And then allowing for substantive education and experience to fill in for that talent. Um, I have been denied positions because I failed to give a transcript that documented my 24 hours and credit hours in calculus. Uh, that's probably an organization that I don't wanna go work for. Um, and I'm not gonna name the organization that yeah. denied me that position. But when I take my interns in, I look at their resume, I assess their skills, I don't really care so much about uh, about their lack of experience because it's not going to be the same in the Air Force. I need to be able to know what tasks I can give them on mm -hmm. day one, where I need to grow them on DOD processes, which which are boring in Manila anyway, and then no, letting them know where th this is actually what really matters here. You just read through a litany of DAU slides, but this is actually where we <laughs> fit, and 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 this is where That's you can really drive home change. <laughs> And deliver to the warfighter while they're a pack with me, and 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 and, and they they take that really 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 well, and then I always approach any civilian in my workforce. They're going to leave. They're going to go somewhere else, whether it be AWS, whether it be another company in Silicon Valley, and I want them to leave my 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 organization as a value add to any other organization. My goal in the chief data officer's goal is to make make the, make the Department of Defense successful in the data arena and AI arena. We're not gonna do that as a 19 person shop. <laughs> We're gonna go out and do other things and have to go work with other offices and be credible individuals. And, and, and I plan for them to leave and I'm, I'm gonna give them as much mentorship and education and opportunity to succeed or fail through that time. I would say the Department of Defense needs more people with your attitude because what we see that in our internship programs, when we are doing our selection process, I'm gonna try to get you to be one of part of our selection committee. Uh, uh, get a, you know, uh, what I notice is everyone focuses on the, on the give me the referral, give me the, the GPA. And what we've learned is there's some freaky things that you find when you interview a, a, a really smart kid. It's like, well, that, that's the next ax murder. <laughs> but with a 4.0, right? You have to interact, and you can't exclude people just based on GPAs. We've seen people with, you know, um, with lower GPAs that are brilliant. They're just they learn differently, right? They're going through school because they're you know they're being asked to. It's the right thing to do. They should go to school, but they struggle. But yet they're brilliant in an unstructured apprenticeship model. And apprenticeship can be a dirty word in most states because it's heavily defined. So we call our program a cybership or a, a mentorship in cyber or a, or a cyber residency. So you you know you you don't want a heart surgeon who graduated from medical school who's never operated in the heart, right? It's like, well, that's why you have a residency. We feel cyber is the same way. Well, you went to school, you learned something. Now let's teach you how to apply it because you've never done it. John, I know you were itching to say something. I'm going to go to... Uh, uh, I just wanted to build on some of these excellent comments is how do we not only bring in new talent, how do we keep the talent we have? And I have seen an incredible brain drain over the past 15 years out of DOD and other agencies where people don't feel they have a place to go up as a techie, as a cyber guy. And they're not rewarded for saying, hey, this thing's messed up. So we have too much bureaucracy that keeps 
and, and these stovepipe jobs that doesn't give a career path or motivation or incentives for folks that grew up through the technical curriculums and, and can continue to advance. Mm -hmm. The chief scientists be fine. They be, don't need to run an agency, but there needs to be career paths where we can keep these great brains. We can get, keep, bring in new gray beards who are semi-retired and help them mentor these young folks because experience matters most. I'll tell you something that comes through our facility quite a bit is the um, overclassification. So our facility is mostly unclassified. We do have classified spaces. That is an important right? issue. So a young person like Caitlin or some of the students that, you know, uh, Imon Harris graduating, when they go into that internship and say, wait a minute, you want me to innovate. Let's use innovation as an example. But I can't click here. I can't download that. I can't get to this site. I, I can't talk to this person who's not in this building. Uh, I can't even use this phone uh, to have that conversation. I can't even say who I am. How the heck do I innovate at the speed of the adversary when you're saying innovate as long as you do it inside this box and don't talk to these people? And yeah, you can't click on a bunch of things, okay? Uh, and then you can't talk about what you're trying to solve. Okay, whoa, that's a great way to innovate, right? So we were designed as an unclassified facility. Um, and I don't know, there are different people who will debate what percentage of the problem set in the intelligence community in a DOD is actually classified. Some people will say it's only about 20% of it, right? Some people will say 30%. The rest is the same plain old vanilla stuff that's accelerating private industry in Silicon Valley. It's I need a VMware, I need a VI, I need multi-factor, I need encryption, I need you know racks of storage and compute power. None of that's, those, all that's commercial. The Department of Defense doesn't invent those technologies. They have certain right. things that they do invent, but most of it they did not, right? So how do I, I find that as a problem with workforce. We're gonna keep people like Caitlin and, and people like Derek engaged, give them the power and the tools to say, when I'm over here, yeah, I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm gonna put it in a box and I'm gonna keep it there. But for me to be able to do this thing, I need to be out here and I need to talk to everyone unfeathered. Okay, as long as you know, it's not maybe China or Russia, but whomever, maybe you still wanna to talk to them, you can flip them, right, to tell you about a secret. Uh, but so we that's one of the things that I've noticed is a challenge to workforce development and workforce pipeline building is, you know, not only that, it takes eight or nine months to even get through the process, if you're lucky, right? To, if, if you're at the SCI level, oh, in the polygraph, oh my God, Jesus. Okay, uh, by the time you got that, AWS is giving you 12 offers and their stock price has gone up. But, you know, so I know that's a deterrent. You wanted to say something, Iman? Well, adding on, uh, the, uh, great points here made by um, everybody on the panel. So I think, how do we innovate? And how, we've heard earlier today, how do we scale? How do we create scalable solutions? Um, and how do we keep it all outcomes focused as well? And I think from the higher ed perspective, what we're doing, it, how we're doing that is by reinventing higher education. Um, we heard about how acquisition processes are behind, uh, you know, <laughs> higher education's behind, right? How do we expect to, if we look at currently, the data shows there's over 600,000 unfilled cyber jobs, and that's, I think, a low estimate because there's a lot of jobs that aren't technically classified as cyber, and that number is going up, so it's going in the wrong direction. We can't expect to use the same antiquated methods that we've been using in higher ed. And so what we're doing is creating those kind of scalable programs where we are going to colleges and universities across the country and saying, well, look, you already have faculty. You've already got curricula. Let us help you figure out how to create agile programs that are more work role based and focused, competency focused and work role based instead of the traditional four year or two year degree program. Because if we take, for example, um, I, from uh, Northwest Florida where I'm at, we've got a huge population of um, transitioning military and veterans. In fact, one of the highest in the country um, of transitioning veterans. The last thing you wanna say is, Go back to school for four years, and by the time you're done, the cyber world will have been so different that none, none, nothing you do will be relevant anymore, right? <laughs> uh, and so and what, you have a bill. <laughs> and so what we're doing is then working with industry to focus on employability. We've got a program that creates training programs, offers training across the country for 15 different cyber work roles. And part of that is kind of to keep up with the innovation is allowing the diversity to come in where cyber isn't all about the technical fields. Yes, we have programs where we're training for cyber defense analysts or network security engineers, but we're also training for cyber auditors, cyber crime investigators, cyber forensics analysts, because you want to be able to kind of leverage people's expertise, backgrounds, and passion, and that'll help them then with the retention, help them stay in the field. Um, and so the national, as an example, the national cyber workforce, which we see as a solution, we want all of 
uh, everyone here to uh, help kind of join in with us as part of the team. Um, the way it works is that anybody really can kind of uh, opt in to take an aptitude assessment test along with their background that will recommend which work roles are for them. So whether that's a high school graduate or whether that's a career changer or whether that's a veteran, it might help them identify if cybercrime investigation or forensics analysis or penetration testing or ethical hacking is more suited for them. It'll let them know which college universities across the country offer upskilling training for those um, pathways, those work roles. It'll identify scholarships. So the program that I mentioned earlier is funded by a $9 million NSA grant that funds 1,700 fully funded veterans and transitioning military across the country to do this training. Um, and then it'll help connect them and apply. So there's a common application where they can apply for this training. In six months, they're done. But the key part that I haven't mentioned yet is the employability. And that's where we need everybody's help because it's really connecting with the employers across sectors, across sizes, hearing from them about what the current and upcoming challenges are, and then feeding them back into the cycle, the training cycle, in a way that's much more dynamic than the higher ed process. Because the more we can connect them, as uh, Armando mentioned, for example, we have students who want to get into SOC roles. Well, how can they get into a SOC role if they can't even get into a SOC, right, uh, as a student? So we built a virtual educational SOC, right, where we they can train as a team across the country. Um, we've learned to do that through COVID, right, the virtual version. Um, and so we need a lot of kind of connections with the employers to really give us that feedback and be able to kind of, in a much more fast, um, agile way, train the next, the future generations, because we want them to be figuring out what the next challenge is and addressing that head on. Interesting. You mentioned SOC. I know Caitlin knows we had our SOC track. So our, um, uh, you also mentioned veterans. We had what, uh, what Warren my heart was seeing so many veterans that it was like, why are these old people? And you know, they weren't old. They're still in their twenties and their thirties, but they had served their nation for two years, three years, seven years. Right. Uh, and now scholarship for service, the CYSA, they were earning their degrees. Right. And we found that to be, uh, amazing. Uh, you know, uh, th to see that that they gave service to the nation, nation was allowing them to get their education. You know, something's doing feedback here, uh, but um, but that was important. Security operations center training. Uh, 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 the interviews are realistic interviews, right? They aren't theoretical. So when I invite Elastic or Amazon or uh, some other big security operations center outsource companies, they're not looking. It's like, oh, you know, you got a degree, you took this thing, whatever. Here's a scenario. Here's a threat. How are you going to navigate that threat? And I know, um, and I know, Caitlin, in your hunt class, you were, yeah, someone's wide open. Someone's coming from there. <laughs> it's another room is feeding. Uh, okay, so uh, so I think that's important. You know, obviously, is the realism, what I call cyber realism. Um, they, 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 what we say is we never try to do what what they do at the or University because they're what, they're good at it, they're accredited at it. We try to build build that bridge, and in her University and a bunch of universities like Purdue and others that I work with are all trying to build those bridges in between academic skills and and and, and credentials versus real world skills. Okay, and I think that that's important uh, as well because um, I, I see a lot of students from around the country. I don't care what school because I review all the curriculums. And I go, well, why did Johnny is still in his old bedroom looking at his prom pictures when he just spent four years of dad and mom's money and <laughs> go to college? It's because. Johnny can't pass an interview. Right? He can't pass the three rounds of questions from Amazon or Google that are technical in nature. It's like everyone that we're interviewing has a degree. Get over it. I want to know what you can do. How do you get that young person or that uh, that veteran to articulate what they can do? I know I work with a lot of veterans who who are, have struggled to translate their resumes into the English of industry. Right? They have a lot of acronyms. Like, yeah, no one's going to understand what that is, dude. You know. Or young lady, uh, you're going to have to change that into English. And so we sometimes we spend a lot of time mentoring them with that resume. Hey, this means cloud. This means you were doing threat hunting. This means you were doing, you know, uh, forensics or whatever that is. Right? Get rid of all that military, you know, mumbo jumbo. Um, so that's one way we get the military back into service. I know you, you, and, and some of the counterparts in your office. You were in industry. You're doing. I'm, I'm sure you're, you're. You could make a lot more money being 
back out in industry, but you're, you're, you, you came back, right? You, you, you came back as some of the people that I know in your office came back to service to the nation. That is incredible to me. I know, cause I know what you guys have given up. I've talked to some of them about, oh, that's, you still have that house? Cause I don't, I don't know if you can swing it on a DOT salary. And they're like, well, that's service to the nation. I put some, you know, some, some squirrel nuts away or whatever. Don, you want to say something? Yeah, you, you, you bring up a, a great point. I mean, we do have a humongous deficit in government and DOD in particular around tech skills here. Um, and the hiring process is a problem. Maybe we need uh, like an HQ, a highly qualified expert program for not only the interns, but the graybeards, so they can come in and help. They either come in and learn and stay, or come in and share knowledge because they've been there, they've done that, they've made their millions of dollars. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've run into folks saying, I'd be willing to come if it wasn't such a pain in the Hmm. Right. To, get to, get, the process. to go and go through the process. So the, yeah. the process of onboarding, whether it's permanent, maybe we need something more temporarily that doesn't require the two year. I'm, I'm exaggerating. Process. Right. It, it just, you say jobs at gov, right? That's at least a year before you hear from them, right? It, it's, <laughs> we need, we need to improve this. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you, you mentioned something. I'm going to put another thing about mentoring. A lot of people don't think about, which is why Caitlin's here. Um, I ran a program last summer for the Marines, Mar Force Cyber. It was Marine civilians. It was uh, offensive cyber marine, Marines, obviously for Mar Force Cyber, and it was college students from Texas A and M, which is one of their recruitment schools. I thought it was going to be really weird, right? You had you know civilians that were former Marines that are now coming back as civilians. They weren't really strong in the cybers, right? But they were there to become stronger in the cybers. You had the warfighter, eight, nine, 10, 15 years with hitting targets, going out, you know, in joint missions or whatever. All right, they know the cybers. Um, maybe they're maybe they're good. But they're going to get frustrated by the people who don't know the cybers. And then we had the college students who were like, "Oh, I got theoretical and I don't know much." But within literally two weeks of this twenty-person cohort that was physical, even during COVID, it was actually physical. They, everyone drove in from Texas, and and the marine, the local marines came in to participate. What I noticed was the young people mentoring the ten or fifteen-year cyber warfighter, uh, saying. You didn't do electrical engineering, did you? I'm like, no, you know, I, I know how to shoot, I know how to write malware, but guess what? That's a programmable logical controller, and it's stepping, and there's two or three of them in, in this system, and there's electrical, uh, uh, you know, step up and step down, and you know that thing that you're trying to make happen? Ain't never gonna work if you don't hit this thing this way, and then that electrical engineering student's writing, you see, Mr. Warfighter? And then, when we did our asymmetric warfare cyber exercise, uh, I saw the warfighter saying, hey, Mrs. Fancy Pants College with multiple master's degree, whatever, you obviously have not been trained on the uh, IPv6 and IPv4 network infrastructure. Let me draw a network map for you because we're getting hit asymmetrically from the, from the other team, the red team, and you're not much help to me because you don't understand the network uh, with your fancy electrical engineering degree. But what I saw was, I'm saying it as it was competitive, it was not. It was, they, they, they actually formed a force. And uh, it, it happened organically, it wasn't part of the program. We are like, they're gonna hate each other. With everyone applied their strength, because we did ransomware, we did firmware attacks, and they were like, the electrical engineer taught the warfighter about electrical engineering, the, the, the master network, the malware. When we had the, um, the, um, the malware exercise, the ransomware exercise, uh, not that many people knew why, how to get to the keys, what were the right keys, how to decrypt, uh, none of that, right? Uh, it took every single element of that team that they formed to do that. So it's, it, it is the mentoring ca can happen both ways because if you've been in government for 32 years, like some of the people I work with, not to insult anyone, it's like, well, what do you really know about the, about the real world? How much have you missed? How, much, how many things have you not been exposed to that someone who works at Google or, or, or Amazon or CrowdStrike can do in a half a second? You have to write six forms in triplicate, you know, go read the Bible and then get re-indoctrinated re before you can ever see it. You know what I mean? And to me, that is part of the process. And so mentoring is bi-directional because there's something we can learn from the next generation, such as Caitlin, you know, because she's learned things that maybe, you know, someone with 32 years or someone that spent a good portion of their life in the military does not know, and it's bi-directional. So we should always look at that problem. And maybe that'll help with retention, where someone like her doesn't go in and it's like, I'm the young one, I'm the woman, I'm the, the, you know, the minority st statistic in cyber. Uh, and they're going to treat me like that, okay? When it's like, wait a minute, I probably know some things. If you just listen to me and let me tell you what my experiences are, I can help you think out of the box because I didn't live in the box. I'm, you know, you're, I'm, 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 I took a job to be in the box, but I can think out of the box because I don't have 32 years of being in the box. 
I, I don't know, Caitlin, what you would want to say about that. Because, again, I mean, I know John Akasoni and everyone said, hey, come work for Topper Command, come over here and say, yeah, you're going to do whatever you want, but, you know, but uh, we only got a couple minutes left. But uh, just can, as the future in workforce and cyber workforce, like none of us that are here are going to be, well, we'll be alive, hopefully, um, if something else not happen, but <laughs> to see what that next chapter is. But you're definitely going to be living it. I'm going to be sitting in my rocking chair fishing or doing something, hoping that you're taking care of the nation in some form. But how do we get you there? Any more, any more thoughts on that? Um, I will say I, I have lived the experience of having someone that is in the DOD tell me there's absolutely no way that you can do this. And um, I obviously took that and I was like, oh, we'll bet. But not everybody's <laughs> going to have that, that reaction. For some people, it's going to be very discouraging. So I definitely agree that like it needs the conversation needs to take place both ways. Like I feel like the DOD, especially the people that have been in for a long time, need to be told, perhaps, you know, like for lack of a better word, they need to be told you have to listen to this person because they do know what they're talking about. And so I feel like accepting that maybe our experiences, although are different than yours, that they are valid. <laughs> And to wrap up, one thing that kind of sticks in my craw is I talk about different critical infrastructure areas. It's all critical infrastructure. It's all interrelated. So if I do something like call hack the port, doesn't mean I'm, I'm not worried about the facility. It doesn't mean I'm not worried about 5G, which is telecom. It's not doesn't mean I'm not worried about rail because there's a rail system that runs through that port. It doesn't mean that I'm not worried about aviation because there's an airport over there that the goods that just came off that ship are going to go to. And it all supports the warfighter in some form or another, or our, our ecosystem that allows our society to work. So I think sometimes over-categorizing everything, putting things in boxes, which is traditional in our life and in our world, limits how people think about it, because we're always discovering that thing, like all the Space Command and Space Force people are telling us, like, who's talking about us? <laughs> we're the guardians. <laughs> it's like, but who's going to help the guardians guard the critical assets? And like I always talk, and people have taught me, space, which you're connected to, it starts on the ground. If you're going to do the cybers, you better figure it out on the ground in the manufacturing and your chip supply, your firmware, uh, before, it ever, before you ever launch it into space. Because once it's up there, that's a different challenge. Would you not agree? And how do we help Space Force and Space Command figure that problem out? Yeah, so I completely agree with Caitlin here. Nothing, there's no policy. There's no decision maker that can just say no anymore. That They just aren't. I mean, they're going to say no at first blush, depending on your rank or who, you, who sent you their way. But if it's if it's a ranking grade thing that 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 can be worked through, um, if it's a law or or a discomfort with something, it's more about educating them on, on them why this is okay or who else has done it in their community that they can trust, and linking those networks up. So um, there's really not much that we can't do in the cyber domain or in the in the in the democratization of data domain or implementation of AI domain. But we need to make sure we're doing it res responsibly and ethically, and that's a big point that I'm trying to make about being here for responsible AI implementation and then knowing where we're putting that and what risk we're carrying by putting that AI technology somewhere in our critical infrastructure. I'd be fired if I didn't say that. Either. So, um, so once you get fired. Um, not, not to say that's a big point that we're trying to drive. Right. And then also, um, who is the true risk assessor on merging data or merging cyber infrastructure and who is that actual decision owner? And, and pulling that back up to where it may have been delegated down to is, is critically important to actually doing it right, but also not um, over, over bureaucratizing that, that, that cyber role. Over. You make so many great points. I just met with uh, some of the AI team from our cyber a couple of weeks ago, and in the algorithms, the cloud, they were big and moving, you know, connecting everything to the cloud, uh, you know, kind of told them a couple of things that we recently learned about, I won't name the company, about, you know, well, the cloud is good until it's not good, right? And there's certain things that uh, you use a certain way or will surprise you that you probably don't want to do there uh, based on things that still need to be worked on. Uh, but, the, but also the nation getting smarter uh, about AI and the algorithms, right? About what the future is going to look like. I don't know if you've seen, we're in the law firm here, but there was a recent thing that passed, I think, in Europe saying, hey, you get the right to ask me to, to see the algorithm. Right? Because if I built the algorithm, I can put the bias in or there can be you know, adversarial attacks against the training data sets that are used for either supervised learning or unsupervised learning. So yeah, that's a big deal. I think we're just maturing in that, having done some work with the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. There's a lot for us to do as a nation. Europe since the, tends to be outpaced. You know, there's the data privacy and all of those things, the PII, the, you know, the classifications, all that stuff that we need to figure out. But with that, I'm going to end. And I'm going to thank you guys. 
One, John, real quick. One last point. Please. Collaboration is key. There is a phenomenal source of knowledge around these nonprofit communities, the standards bodies. They embody the knowledge of Fortune 500 in Silicon Valley. If you're not working with them, you're missing an opportunity to learn. And I'll close with this. It's all critical infrastructure. If you ignore one, you're going to get bit by the other. I mean, it all interconnects, and uh, we see it all the time. You know, medical. You know, it's all you know, the grid, satellite systems. Your phone is going to work. Your GPS, your computer timing is going to go off. Your navigation systems on ships. It's all interrelated. And when we're looking at the problem, we need to look at it in a global setting, not in an isolated. Hey, I'm in the grid, so I'm not going to worry about the facility. Okay. Well, I'm in the facility. I'm doing facility cyber, and I'm not going to worry about the network. I do weapon systems, so I don't care about any of it except my weapon systems. It's all interconnected, and the adversary goes to hunt where we're not looking. So we, we're pretty good about publishing all of our standards. They're pretty good about reading them. <laughs> you know? So uh, you can come in with as many standards as you want. They're always going to find a way to punch a hole into that. And with that, I'm going to end. I'm going to thank Bryson and this incredible event. Uh, it's phenomenal. It's my first time here. Thank you. Uh, you know, he's smart. He's prescient. He's a savant. Thank you. <laughs>